Is 3D finally here to stay? The current 3D boom has brought Hollywood the fastest revenue it's ever seen. But through the years, from its origins before photography to the blockbusters of today, 3D has had to fight for survival and has more than once been declared dead. Join us for an in-depth look at some of the inventors and innovations that have driven 3D since its birth over 150 years ago. It must be nearly 50 years now that I've been collecting 3D photographs. It's an obsession that began when I was a kid and I discovered that I could make things appear to move by alternately blinking each eye. Because most of us have two eyes, we have binocular vision, which means that our brains receive two separate pictures at any one time. If we separate the two images, we can see that they look pretty much the same but there are actually slight differences between them. When our brain combines those two separate images, that's when the magic happens. Evolution has taught our brains to interpret those small parallax differences as depth, as solidity, as space. The principles of binocular vision were glimpsed by some of the greatest thinkers in history. But it took the genius of Wan, Victorian Britain, to realize its incredible potential. Charles Wheatstone was one of Britain's most prolific inventors. He gave us the telegraph, the concertina, and for electricians, the Wheatstone Bridge. But perhaps his greatest gift to us all was giving birth to 3D, when, in 1838, he invented the stereoscope. Wheatstone drew two pictures, flat representations of a geometrically shaped object viewed from two slightly different angles. He then put them in his stereoscope and ingeniously arranged two 45 degree mirrors to ensure that each picture was presented to the relevant eye. Looking into the device, sure enough, the two flat pictures coalesce into one beautiful stereo image, showing the appearance of the object in three dimensions. Very much like the real thing. But it was what happened next, the invention of photography, that really set our story in motion. The amazing thing was, this is within a year of Henry Fox Talbot discovering the positive negative photographic process that is still in use today. And Daguerre in France had come up with a daguerreotype. So now for the first time, photographers were commissioned to shoot pictures taken from one camera, moving it to the side, taking a second picture, and then those were then put into Wheatstone's stereo viewer. And this was stunning. And the results we see today from these very first stereoscopic pairs, until you look at them in true 3D, you don't realize how beautiful and well composed these images are. The only problem with this sidestep approach was that if anything moved between the two shots, there was a disturbance in the 3D effect. The next approach was to have two cameras which you would place side by side to take separate photographs. And by logical extension, instead of having two cameras, you would put two lenses in one camera. Yeah. I've got in front of me here the first commercially made binocular or twin lens stereo camera. And this was designed by the Manchester uh, optician, uh, John Benjamin Dancer, in 1856. One of the most significant stereo cameras ever made. In just a few years, a whole spectrum of amazingly talented stereoscopic artist photographers emerged. Antoine Claudet, William England, Mason of Brighton, William Grundy, Francis Frith, William Russell Sedgefield, James Elliott, Alfred Sylvester, Fizz, and my personal hero, 
Thomas Richard Williams. My passion for T.R. Williams led me to spend over 30 years seeking out just one series of his photographs. They're called Scenes in Our Village, and the study, along with my colleague, photo historian Elena Vidal, led to our book, A Village Lost and Found. The commercial success of these stereo card images in the 1850s was made possible by the invention of a more portable stereoscope. This is a type of stereo viewer that was designed by Sir David Brewster, the eminent scientist in the late 1840s. The key breakthrough that uh, Brewster incorporated was instead of using mirrors like Charles Wheatstone used for his reflecting stereoscope, he used lenses. And that meant the viewer could be much more compact, much, uh, much easier to handle, sort of thing you could, you could have on your, on your desk, on the table at home. Queen Victoria was shown one of these stereoscopes. And she was so impressed, she ordered one for her personal use. And that started a craze. If it was good enough for Queen Victoria and Albert, then it was something that most middle class families wanted to see for themselves. After Queen Victoria had given stereoscopy uh, her blessing, photographers were sent all over the world to photograph scenes. These were then sold as stereo cards, and they were producing tens of thousands of these, in totaling millions, literally millions of stereo cards over a period of years. And they always said that every home should have a stereoscope, and it's really like the TV of the day. There was a stereoscope for every taste and every pocket. At the cheapest end of the market, you could pay two and six. At the top end of the market, such as this, you could be paying over 20 pounds. This was the 50-inch plasma screen of its day. This is the stereoscope that your neighbors would kill you for. By the end of the 1860s, stereo cards were already out of fashion, and some photographers turned their attentions to capturing movement. 3D movie making has to be attributed to many different individuals prior to 1900s, and they were in Germany, France, Great Britain, and the United States. Mm -hmm. And we should not be surprised to learn that Wheatstone, once again, made uh, an experiment with stereo movie making in 1870. The first 3D film camera was actually made by William Fries Green. As you can see at the front, we've got two holes for two lenses. We've not got the lenses, unfortunately. If we turn this round, if I can open the back, it's just around the time that celluloid has become available. You can see the size of it. It would have been hand-cranked. This really makes moving pictures possible. You're essentially putting a strip of still pictures through the camera. We're here talking about 1890, 1893. Trouble is, he only managed to do a few frames. It would rip the emulsion to bits. And also, his speed of taking was literally click, click, click. Nevertheless, Freeze Green's memorable images qualify as the first 3D movie. The next inventor went to the other extreme. Now, this is really a remarkable camera. I suppose, in, in many ways, it's the first successful stereo camera, though it's quite bizarre, really. It took up to 2,000 frames a second. And it was invented by Lucien Boulle specifically for the study of the flight of insects. And it dates from 1903. Having said that it works at 2,000 frames a second, it only contains 54 frames of film. So it's only shooting about 40th of a second. And at the appropriate moment, you release the fly, open the shutter, and got your 40th of a second in stereo. Bull went on to capture exploding light bulbs and even flying bullets, proving film's unique ability to make time elastic. The prophetic vision of all these pioneers just needed a hundred years to get up and running. In 3D filmmaking, capturing the left eye and right eye moving images is only half the problem. Arguably, the tougher half is finding a way to show them. 
because projecting two separate pictures on a screen, each of which must be seen by only one of our eyes, is one of 3D's recurring stumbling blocks. In the first Nickelodeons, each of the 2D films, the Flatties, came on a large, heavy reel and was shown from a single projector. But because 3D films were shot on two cameras, they would have needed two reels. Double the trouble. The kinds of subject matter in the very first 3D movies were typical of the very first movies. But the films were not shown because it was simply impractical at that time. It was yeah. difficult enough to show a 2D movie. Initially, the only way to show stereo moving images was by printing them onto cards that were made into a kind of flicker book on a wheel turned by a crank handle. The very first films made for a paying audience that were shot in 3D were created in 1903 by one of cinema's greatest artists, Georges Méliès, but Méliès never intended them to be seen in 3D. Probably to avoid paying tax on importing film prints into America, Méliès came up with an extraordinary ruse to make two negatives at the same time. Méliès put two cameras onto a single crank and by doing so, inadvertently made 3D movies. These sequences have never before been seen in 3D. So I'm delighted to say this is a premiere, a glimpse of the world's first master of cinema in unintentional stereo. The two negatives lived on different continents for over a hundred years. Wink and you'll see that one of them has been colorized. All the evidence suggests that Melius never planned to show these films in 3D. The story then really moves to America and the work of Edwin S. Porter, who is very famous as a director, particularly for his film The Great Train Robbery, who teamed up with a man called William Waddell, who had done quite a lot of work on color. And they uh, showed a series of films in 1915. This was the first time that a cinema audience were able to enjoy the shared experience of watching 3D movies and the first time that they wore special glasses. People were astonished to see that kind of depth projected large on a screen. And the press reports of the Porter and Waddell 3D screening from 1915 were highly laudatory. 3D movies were shown in a great wave throughout the 20s um, all over the United States and indeed the world. These movies showcased the novelty of 3D. For a long time, these films could only be seen using anaglyph, a color-based system for ensuring that each eye only saw its correct image. You need to be able to separate your left and right eye images. The red will filter out the green image so you don't see the other eye and, and vice versa. The main limitation of the anaglyph system is that what you're seeing is, a, is effectively a black and white image, a monochrome you can't really get a full color image when you're looking through a red or a green filter. In the 1930s, Edwin Land, who would later on be very famous for the Polaroid camera, introduced Polaroid filters. If something is uh, uh, polarized in the vertical direction, it will block out anything coming in the horizontal direction and vice versa. At last, you could see 3D movies in color. The first big technical move forward for 3D was really for the, the, the Festival of Britain. 1951, the year of the Festival of Britain, dedicated by the King in St Paul's Cathedral to crown a century of British achievement. I declare the Festival of Britain open. The Spottiswood brothers, uh, Raymond and Nigel, uh, were commissioned by the BFI to make a number of short films um, for the Festival of Britain. How do you do? I've come along to talk to you about the theories of a stereoscopical transmission. Watch carefully now as I move forward. There, did you notice? Do you notice I actually do move forward from there to here? Yes, sir. 
Spotted Woods coined the term 3D to describe their five films, which were groundbreaking for having stereo sound as well as stereo pictures. Accurate enough for you? They sort of basically designed the contemporary configuration of mirror rigs, and that's to have a, a camera looking through and then a camera either looking down from above or up from below. One of my favorite 3D films is Around is Around by Norman McLaren, shown at the Festival of Britain. These movies really announced the format of the future for 3D movies, which was a silver screen, polarizing filters, and two projectors showing dual band 35 millimeter 3D. By the middle of the 20th century, movies had a monopoly on entertainment. And Hollywood ruled the world. Their reign typified by glamorous movie stars and super rich studios. But by the beginning of the 1950s, the golden age was already over, sweeping into the homes of people in America and Europe was a new phenomenon, television. Cinema box office dropped by 50% in just a few years, and film theaters were closing every week. So Hollywood needed a big idea, fast. Arch Obler, who was the writer and director of Buona Devil, that uh, launched in, at the end of 1952, he saw these short films uh, for the Festival of Britain. They'd been put together in a program uh, over in the States, and Art Jobler thought, crikey, this is fantastic, I want some of that. And in fact, he was already 10 days into filming, so he, he scrapped the 10 days filming and started uh, filming uh, Buona Devil in 3D. Saib? Yes? In India, the jungle has many sounds. Hyena. Buona Devil was playing in only two theaters in Hollywood and there were lines around the block, even though it wasn't a terribly great film. In fact, Life magazine characterized it as a cheap, preposterous film. Of all the time for clothes. Rival studio bosses didn't hesitate to cash in on this new fascination for 3D. As soon as Jack Warner saw and read about the lines around the block, he immediately put House of Wax into production with the one-eyed director, Andre de Toth. House of Wax is a remarkable film because even though de Toth only had one eye, he had a great understanding of Z-space storytelling and how to use 3D. As the public poured in to see House of Wax, Hollywood couldn't make 3D films fast enough. And with each new movie, they tried to get closer and closer to their customers' noses. But not everyone was enjoying 3D, and some started complaining of eye strain, headaches, and even nausea. It was difficult to project dual-band 3D movies because two projectors were required, even though the theaters had two projectors. They had to, in most cases, hire a second projectionist, which was a union situation. But technically, it was too difficult. It was daunting. You couldn't get the projectors to run together. But people blamed the glasses, because that was what the visible change. Nobody was up. The audience couldn't see what was going on in the projection booth. Some of the films that came very late in the cycle of the 3D 50s movies were not given widespread exhibition in stereo. By the time Hitchcock comes along and does Dial M for Murder, the interest in, in, in 3D has declined. I think there's this wonderful statement he makes about, you know, 3D was a nine-day wonder, and I came in on the ninth day. Um, but by, by 1955, to all extents and purposes, 3D sort of disappeared from the schools. Oh, gosh. So 3D had given Hollywood no more than a brief moment of glory, and the studios turned their attentions to other formats, widescreen, VistaVision, CinemaScope, and they started making content for TV. A classic case of, if you can't beat them, buy them. It really was CinemaScope that killed the 3D movies of the 50s and the fact that exhibitors had to decide which way to go. And they ultimately decided to go wider, not deeper. The stereo realist camera kept 3D photography alive but it would be many years before the corpse of 3D cinema would be resurrected 
by a rush of blood from a surprising source. A normal screen has just two dimensions. It has width, which we can call x. It has height, which we can call y. And if we're looking at the screen, we're focusing on just one flat plane. But with 3D, we have the illusion of a third dimension, depth. And that's what 3D filmmakers like to call the z-plane, or the z-axis. And my hand is moving in what they like to call negative space. Sorry, we had to do that too. It was in the 60s that 3D reached out to me. And like many kids, it reached out to me through Weetabix. In those days, Weetabix would give away a free 3D card with every packet. Shame they don't do it now. Anyway, then you send off your one and sixpence and three packet tops, and they send you in the post a stereoscope. When I got mine, I was hooked. I still get that buzz from that moment when two flat pictures fuse into glorious 3D. And although these were wilderness years for mainstream 3D movies, there were still people who enjoyed the excitement that Z-Space brought into their lives. A very important film for this interim period was The Stewardesses. It proved a massive financial success, opening in 1969 in only two theaters. Two years later, it had gone well on its way to earning over $10 million. So there was a wave in the 1970s of 3D movies that were single-strip anaglyph, as with the work of Deep Vision, uh, Norm de Plume, otherwise known as Steve Gibson and Arnold Hare. At the time, films were becoming more explicit, and they were uh, playing in New York City on 42nd Street and the like, and mostly there were documentary films, mm -hmm. like Sexual Freedom in Denmark, and we thought we would adapt to that change and offer three-dimensional sexy movies, and it was very successful. Since we were shooting hardcore, we wanted to have as much stuff as possible come off the screen and into theater space. This was basically falling under the realm of ballistics. And we had to consider barrel length, whether it should be long or snub-nosed. We pulled out all the stops we even shot in CinemaScope. 3D technology had spent several years underground, but now, once again, it caught Hollywood's attention. By the late 1970s, Hollywood is again experiencing a major attack from a new technology. They're already in competition with an increasing number of TV channels. Now, along comes the home video cassette. Cinemas closed and closing throughout the country. A one-time 1,500 million cinema goers a year, now down to a mere 80 million, and forecasts that the worst is yet to come. The fall is blamed on the video film market which now makes films available in your home at less than the cost of many cinema seats. So Hollywood decided to give 3D another shot. The um, 50s was the usual mix of Hollywood product. You had A pictures, you had Z pictures, but in the 80s you really had terrible, terrible movies. Pictures that had no content at all, they were just about throwing things at the audience. The prize for the most in-your-face 3D from this period has to go to a violent western appropriately called Coming At Ya. Almost every shot sends something into negative space. It's pretty exhausting to watch, but you have to admire their commitment. All the producers and everybody that were, were out of that, that age were always looking at um, sticking paddle balls and things in people's faces and uh, yeah, you got to get it out there. You know, the 3D, you got to give them some 3D. As we got into the 80s, uh, you know, it was sort of a, a reason for every movie that had uh, the third in a series. Amityville 3D, Jaws 3D, they were all the third in the series, trying to just be exploitive. They weren't about improving the art form. During the 1980s, studio theme parks and Disneyland began to lure Hollywood's hottest directors to create mega-budget 4D attractions 
these were short 3D movies with added physical elements, such as moving seats and jets of air or water fired at the audience. Theme parks tend to be a little more in your face, and it, they are more gimmicky by nature. I mean, the, the 4D experience is meant to thrill and excite and, mm. you know, uh, prod the audience. So you're going to get a lot more of that off-screen, those off-screen moments. Some of the best are right here in Universal Studios, King Kong, Shrek, and perhaps most significantly of all, the ride which led James Cameron into the third dimension, Terminator 2 3D. We tried to do it in a cinematic style, yeah. consistent with the movies, with yeah. the Terminator films, but it was still a theme park attraction. And there were no 3D theaters out there. There was no place to th play a 3D movie, even if you shot one. So yeah. I, it, I, I never really thought of it as, as the way that films would get made. Travel forward in time to 2004, and there was still nowhere to show a 3D movie, assuming you wanted to make one. I did not say, hey, I want to make a 3D movie. Mm -hmm. And so let's find something I can make in 3D. It was the other way around. I wanted to make Polar Express in, as a digital film. And then it was like, hey, guess what? You're working, everything in this realm that you're working in, this virtual realm, is 3D anyway. We had no idea that what we were doing was going to be uh, as influential or as what some people have called as, as revolutionary as it was. We released the movie on somewhere around 65 to 70 locations. And in the first year, we generated $45 million worth of box office. These huge returns and the development of digital projectors meant that the multiplexes were starting to believe that the writing on the screen now said 3D. So the first wave of 3D that we were involved with was the cinema and the launching of digital 3D. And that technology was actually built uh, originally based on a concept by a very creative gentleman named Lenny Lipton mm -hmm. and a company called Stereo Graphics. And at Stereo Graphics Corporation, my colleagues and I invented almost every significant stereoscopic, electronic stereoscopic invention. We invented the shuttering glasses, sold a couple hundred thousand pairs of those to people in. Uh, molecular modeling mostly. We invented the Z-screen, which is uh, used for uh, cinema projection. It's the basis of the real D system. We started looking at those tools because when we, we, we started our quest, the only people that were making 3D in a serious way were the military. At Show West, 2005, we presented 3D and, and, and exhibitors came. But they didn't come because they believed in 3D. They came because we had Jim Cameron, we had George Lucas, we had Bob Zemeckis, we had Robert Rodriguez. All of a sudden, the exhibition community saw something that digital projection provided that 35 millimeter film projecting couldn't provide, which is high quality 3D. And it began an infusion of rolling out digital projection, which was critical to getting to 3D presentation in the theaters. The films that really stick out for me, Chicken Little being our first film, uh, was a very special moment. And to get those first 100 theaters up was a really an amazing milestone. It was very much a case of, here's the finished movie, add depth to it. From a creative point of view, all the decisions have been made in terms of the content of the shot. And we were making the best of it. I think the next one that really kind of made the industry kind of wake up and take pause was probably Nightmare Before Christmas. I am the one hiding under your bed, teeth ground sharp and eyes glowing red. This was a reissue, a film that had been out on video for more than 10 years. And they went and did a conversion from 2D to 3D and had a very, very successful response. That was my first experience with conversion, which is a world of pain because you're literally taking your flat image, cutting it all up into pieces, separating them out, trying to put roundness in, trying to fill in the missing pieces. U2 3D in 2007 was the most ambitious 3D undertaking so far. The filmmakers had to beg, borrow, and invent the technology they needed to be able to realize their vision. U2 3D for us was going to be the example of what 3D could be. I would go out before the shows and talk to the audiences 
maybe introduce it. This camera is from Mr. Cameron. This camera had been used by Mr. Lucas. And then on cue, the operators and the grips would swing the cameras when they saw it over the audience. Now, the interesting thing about a director who'd never directed a feature film before, but as a sculptor, sculptors think in space. They think spatially. When you work in the live space, yeah. you really have to work with the architecture of the set, the lighting design, the audience's ability to interact with the band in a space. It is like working with clay or wax. You're able to think top, bottom, side, back. 2009's My Bloody Valentine seriously invaded personal Z space and attracted huge late night crowds. Well, My Bloody Valentine was shot on location in a practical mine in Pennsylvania. And Max had to come up with a way to invert the rig so that we could get the camera up to a very low ceiling in the mine. But Patrick Lussier, the director, knew exactly what he wanted from the Z space. And I feel like he was pleasantly surprised to find out that Max could give it to him. My job as stereographer is to con control and, and give, make sense and repeat what they want, the way they want it. If they, they want an aggressive picture, make it aggressive, make it in their face. If they want something that's deep, make it deep. <laughs> You're, you're just the instrument, they're, they're kind of playing you. At the end of the decade, the cutting-edge Coraline amplified its character's emotions with the seductively scary depth of its fantasy world. Huh? Mom? What are you doing here in the middle of the night? You're just in time for supper, dear. Finally, Z Space had come of age, and 3D films had become art. Digital technology has now made it possible to create 3D movies entirely inside the computer or with ever smaller camera rigs like the ones we use to make this documentary. This cutting edge equipment is the result of 150 years of obsessive geniuses from those early pioneers to a growing fraternity of electronics innovators and software artists. But in 2007, Hollywood still had a lot to learn. Just in order to get everybody's attention at the outset, I said, well, of course, every single movie will be in 3D in it, because if nothing else, it was controversial, and it got people really engaged. I'm not sure I really believe it. <laughs> Monsters vs. Aliens was the start of all those things you have to get in place to be able to make a stereo movie. The tool set, artist training, projectors in the theater. So there was a whole learning curve there for the studio of just getting up and running. From the in-your-face films of the 50s and 80s, we know 3D can get our attention, but a new generation of 3D film artists are learning to use stereo to tell the story. Are you consciously leading people in during the film? Are you giving them like the the very comfortable, easy stereo experience and then gradually leading them out into more depth? It's a really good question and um, I, I, I don't know if you've had a chance to see Up, but there's a wonderful emotional scene toward the end where Carl, our main character, is looking through a memory book and he comes to a realization about how his wife felt about their life together. And for every successive shot back at Carl, we take the 3D a little deeper and a little deeper and a little deeper as he becomes emotionally aware and has this awakening. It's a man sitting in a chair with a book, but the feelings are entirely different. Mm. At first, he feels cold and removed, and at the last shot, he feels dimensional, warm. To create a quality 3D experience, artists have to understand how we see. You have two sets of muscles in your eyes, one yeah. for focus, so you're focusing close or far, mm. and then one for convergence, so your eyes are towing in near or far. Yeah. And our entire life, those two muscle systems work together uh, as we're look, yeah. viewing the world. Yeah. But when we watch a 3D movie, you're always going to be the same distance from the screen, be it 25 feet or so, but you're asking your eyes to now converge in. Yeah. So the muscle system of focus and convergence that are usually linked are now 
separated. The culmination of this knowledge was at the heart of 2009's great turning point for 3D. We adopted a technique for Avatar based on testing and based on, uh, on sort of years of thinking about how we were gonna do this, that's now pretty much the standard of the, of the business, but it wasn't at the time. And the technique is to put the convergence plane always at the subject of greatest interest. That way the eye never has to adjust from one plane to another. For some reason, there was this old school stereography concept that the convergence had to be back at the so-called screen plane. And we threw that out. We said there is no screen plane. The audience doesn't think there's a screen plane. The audience thinks they're looking through a window. You're not used to your avatar body. This is dangerous. This is great. One of the scenes where we really did play stereo so that it came off, it appeared to come off in front of the screen plane, is when the wood sprites land on Jake. But we used that, and Jim did it very consciously out of narrative storytelling. So when he went to a shot up in the sky of the wood sprites, they were the in theater space and they took our eye back into the narrative storytelling flow. However, in a scene a little bit before that where Jake's in the jungle and he has a spear out, we don't have people ducking in the audience. Because for us, every time you have somebody realizing they are watching a 3D effect, you've interrupted the suspension of disbelief. The true sense of immersion in that space, to me, was was significant in the way that it was different to the stereo that we have set here. It was peripheral depth stereo as a movie style. And I think that's why people had that desire to return to the planet so many times. In the way, you had to kind of reset, and Avatar kind of, it was no longer the question of if 3D at that point. It was how quickly were you going to get up to speed on 3D, and how quickly were you going to have your next production ready for 3D. By the time we got to How to Train Your Dragon, we were really at a point where we could make good-looking 3D relatively easily. The next question was, what do we want to do with the 3D beyond just 2D plus depth? When Hiccup first finds the dragon that he thinks he's going to kill, he's trying to get himself fired up to kill the dragon and be the hero of the village. We are absolutely ramping these shots in depth so that the intensity of the moment as he's building himself up, that the depth is literally building and pushing out towards the audience. Our natural inclination going in was, you know, that this was going to be most effective in the big sort of action sequences of the film. They were able to do some dazzling work in the flying sequences of that movie. But for me, the one that showed me a scene between Hiccup and his dad when his dad goes into his room and he's way too big to fit in the room. Dad, you're back. I, uh... You stand in the back of an audience and you watch that. The audience actually ducks down. They actually feel as though they're in the environment. There's a key part at the end of How to Train Your Dragon where mm. you know the worst has happened. And we decided for the first time in that sequence to set all the stereo very flat and very far back. I'm so sorry. And then Toothless eventually like unrolls the wings and we literally bring the stereo alive in this moment. Hiccup! Every grown up that, that I know who's seen Toy Story 3 has cried. You right. know, and that's an amazing thing to pull off. How do you start to tell your story and, and what does 3D mean in that process? The way I described it to Bob from the very beginning is that I wanted the movie or the experience of watching the 3D movie to feel like you were watching a movie through a Viewmaster. Right. You know, so it wasn't about stuff flying into the theater in a gimmicky way. It was about looking through a Viewmaster and recapturing that magic that I remembered from when I was a kid of just letting your eye wander around through uh, this 3D space. This one shot in particular where Buzz kind of extends his hand to Woody. And, you know, we could have gotten tricky with it and had Buzz's arm actually come out of the screen into the theater, but again, that would have been one of those distracting moments. So we kept everything contained within the frame, but there's still so much depth to that image of Buzz reaching out to Woody. It, for me, that depth just underscores the, the, the emotion that's already happening in the scene. First thing I would tackle is, well, where is the audience going to be looking? And they're going to be looking most likely right at Woody, right at his eyes. 
And then I can move later in the shot to the point where he reaches farthest forward, and I can put in a near guide, boom, like this. At the tip of his fingers, I'm able to dial in the exact pixel separation that I want for his fingers at that point. Jesse. It's going to feel you know, dimensional and rewarding, but not too much. So we're looking here into the, the virtual yeah. landscape which you've created. It's exactly. Amazing. You can just go anywhere you like go. as a viewpoint, right? Yeah, so anywhere you where like. where stereo comes from. Unbelievable. Ask me how I'm going to do it. Go on, ask. How are you going to do it? <laughs> We've seen here at DreamWorks in just a very short period of time, we've now, I think we're on our fourth or fifth uh, 3D production, and the sort of building reservoir of knowledge and experience that's being passed from uh, filmmaking team to filmmaking team, um, and then how each uh, subsequent one is actually able to add on top of that knowledge base is actually really exciting. I'm going to give someone, I don't know who yet, Metroman's powers. And so it's not a gimmick anymore. It's now a fine-tuned and very precise and very beautiful uh, device, both for authoring movies and also for uh, projecting them in movie theaters. Do you think it is here to stay now? I believe so. I believe so. I mean, I think, you know, first of all, we see in 3D, and so there are parts of the brain that are there just to take in that stereoscopic information. Mm -hmm. I think with good 3D, there's, there are more connections being made in the brain during the watching process. The brain's mm -hmm. essentially more active, mm -hmm. and that sort of translates to, to a greater feeling of participation. Now, you know, cinema in general has the challenge of, of embracing 3D and folding it into our art form in, a, in an organic way. And I think different filmmakers will do it. They'll, they'll, they'll paint with these new colors in their own way. Some will push the 3D more. Some will integrate it more. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll seek different uh, camera solutions. M my personal challenge is going to be to improve the the end-to-end -end technical chain of, of creating 3D. This third boom of 3D movies has already given us many great experiences over the last few years. And most surprising of all, perhaps, we're already able to see 3D at home with pillars of television like Sir David Attenborough leading the way with his documentary, Flying Monsters. I think it's an awesome film, absolutely awesome. And I'm glad you like it. Did you find yourself getting drawn into the business of convergence and, and baselines? Oh, and absolutely. And I remember the first time I saw a 3D camera, thinking, hello, you know, we're going back to where we were, you know, in 1952. I mean, there were whopping great cameras then. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the colour cameras, the first colour cameras I worked with, the size of a small bath, you know. <laughs> and they were back to that. In television, it seems to me uh, that uh, 3D is, is so compelling that it is um, a sort of, it demands you, it requires you to look at it in a way which we've got out of looking as far as television is concerned. We've been looking at the whole history of 3D, of course, and it's come and gone many times. It yes. was huge in the 1850s, which is my big passion. 1850s? In the 1850s, yes. I mean, because um, 3D goes back to the birth of photography itself with, mm. with um, Charles Wheatstone. Well, yeah, I mean, I know the stereo pairs, mm. and I've got yeah. quite a lot of uh, collection of, of uh, 19th century stereo pairs. Oh, uh, well, that's my big passion, yes. Uh, have you? Have you got swaps? I might have. <laughs> we can talk swaps. <laughs> As an artist, I can identify with this new breed of quality 3D movie makers. Partly because they have had to design and build their own tools and instruments. And with each new release, we can see that they're becoming virtuosos, putting great ideas and even greater talent behind heart-stopping stories. Where 3D is going is anybody's guess, but it's clear we're only at the beginning. I suspect the best is yet to come.